Hello everyone, I'm Aoife Sullivan and I'm Causeway's Events and Membership Engagement Manager and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today for another Causeway event. Um, I'm delighted we're going to have a really interesting panel discussion here today with a diverse range of business leaders from across remote regions of Scotland and Northern Ireland um, who are going to share their insights and experiences of trading and exporting across the Irish Sea and around the world. Uh, we have, it's really great, we have loads of delegates here today from across Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland and our panel today are calling in from as far away as the Outer Hebrides to rural Donegal. Uh, first, I'm just going to give you some very quick housekeeping. Everyone is on mute to begin with, but this is going to be an interactive event. You will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end to our panel and I'd encourage you throughout the event to leave questions or comments in the chat, which we can hopefully get to at the end of the session. We are also recording today's event um, to be distributed later on our Causeway channels and we'll send you a link to that once it's up and live. Um, I'm aware we have loads of delegates here today who, who aren't Causeway members at the moment, that's okay, we're a very friendly inclusive organisation. So I'm going to briefly pass you over to one of our Causeway directors, Judith O'Leary. Those who don't know Judith, she's managing director of her own communications agency Represent in Edinburgh. And um, she works with a range of clients in fintech, food and drink, tourism and hospitality, uh, education and professional services. Over to you Judith. Thanks so much, Issa. Um, yeah, I'm from Cork originally and now in Edinburgh and very much enjoying um, talking to you today. I've been a member of Causeway for three and a half years and it's an absolutely great organisation to be involved with. It was founded at Edinburgh Castle in 2016 and it really is growing really rapidly. We've got members from across Scotland, Ireland and Northern Ireland and we all share that same interest, which is building professional relationships and boosting trade on both sides of the Irish Sea. Our role really is to protect and enhance this trading relationship between Scotland and Ireland, um, no matter what the political or economic environment is. And we've certainly seen a lot of changes to that over the recent 12 months. We really pride ourselves on providing an informal business platform that allows businesses to connect, communicate and collaborate and we're really proud of the work that Aoife and her team have done throughout these last six months to make sure that that um, vision is still communicated and continued even during Covid. So you'll be aware that many billions worth of trade is transacted bilaterally between Scotland and Ireland and the island of Ireland every year. Um, and many thousands of Irish people provide skills and talent into the Scottish industry and the Scots doing the same throughout Ireland. With the EU exit for the UK fast approaching and COVID-19 impacting drastically our economies, it's now more important than ever using the Causeway platform that we protect those sort of numbers and ensure that trading relationship between Scotland and the island of Ireland is maintained and enhanced. We're delighted our network today continues to grow across our regions um, and we've been bringing more and more Irish, Northern Irish and Scottish professionals from a diversity of sectors together to share experiences and insights through our business network and events programme. Today is a shiny example of that work. We continue to work in partnership with the British and Irish Trading Alliance, with whom we offer dual membership and a wide range of be benefits. And we've also this year welcomed the Federation of Small Business and the Edinburgh Chamber of Commerce as new corporate members. This year we've also launched a new venture, our professional partners programme to help provide a meaningful channel for graduates and young professionals in our network to be formally connected to more experienced leaders in business. 
for career support and learning. And again, this is something that's really important during COVID because that has been stripped away as an opportunity for most people. So in essence, Causeway is about connecting people and providing a space and platform for business growth and opportunities. I would encourage you, if you're interested and truly serious about developing business connections across Scotland and Ireland and expanding your network to open up potential opportunities that you join Causeway. On to today, our key host for today's event is Martin McBride, a fellow colleague of mine and board member. He is currently living in Donegal, runs his consultancy Envision from Belfast and is an international trade consultant. He has over 30 years of experience working with businesses across the island of Ireland, Scotland and Scandinavia and helps them to build and reach new international markets. He has pulled together a fantastic panel of speakers today from across remote regions of Scotland and Ireland to share their experiences and insight of successfully trading across the Irish Sea and beyond. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Judith. Um, and what I'd like to do just now is, is introduce you briefly to everybody who's going to be speaking this afternoon. I'll, I'll do a little bit more detailed intro then as we bring everybody into the, into the discussion. Um, but yeah, as, as Judith said, we've got fantastic speakers um, and as Aoife said, from all around the peripheral regions um, and that's something I really wanted to achieve in this discussion is to, to draw in companies who are from all around the regions, peripheral regions and the highlands and islands of, of Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, businesses and industries that I guess really sustain the local economies that we all come from. And, and I think it's important that, that we explore that and the value that we deliver to those communities and those places um, at, through exporting and, and through, I suppose, increasing the economic activity in those regions through exporting. Um, first off, we have Mark Wilson, who's Marketing Director from Gale Force Group in Inverness. Um, and Gale Force has bases all around the Highlands and the Islands indeed. Um, focusing on aquaculture technology, supplying the equipment that fish farmers use to produce their product. Um, and Mark is also a board member of Inverness Chamber. Um, George Fleming, who's founder and chairman of Fleming Agri Products in new buildings just outside Derry and selling agricultural machinery um, in Scotland, in fact, from Northern Ireland, uh, but also all around the world, New Zealand, USA, and building that business um, for some time. Uh, also former chairman, or sorry, former president rather of London Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Jamie McGowan, who's founder and managing director of Essence of Harris from the Isle of Harris. Uh, and also in fact is building other businesses um, in Loomshed, Hebridean Brewery, and you may have seen online recently his launch of Loomshed Delis. Um, so Jamie's been building the Essence of Harris brand around the world. In fact, a lot of LinkedIn publicity recently or just in the last few days about activity in China. So that brand is building its footprint quite widely. Uh, Philip Conacher, Conacher, yes, from Ashley Contracts in Kirkcubbon, who in fact is doing most of his business in Scotland in marine civil engineering and coastal defense. Um, some interesting projects. We've got some pictures to show you in a few minutes. And Martin Murray, uh, founder and managing director of Dunnet Bay Distillery, um, producing gin and vodka and we'll show you a couple of examples of that product on the screen as we've talked to Martin in a wee while. Uh, product is, is on the market not terribly long. Uh, the business is relatively new but has grown rapidly in a lot of international markets and we'll show you that footprint just briefly on the slide as well. Um, and Martin was also awarded a, an Instituted Directors Director of the Year Award in, in 2020 uh, for, for the growth that that business has achieved. So if we can start and come around to talk to Mark. Um, we want to ask everybody a number of questions about their export experiences, about some of the challenges. So we build up a little bit of understanding of some of the, 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 the opportunities, challenges that, that have emerged. Feel free to ask questions. Um, we'll pick up those questions, perhaps a little bit on the, on the journey through the discussion, certainly at the end, because we have a good 25 minutes at the end to have a, a chat. So Mark, if we, if we begin with, with Gale Force, um, from my experience of, of you and Gale Force and knowledge of the company, you've been a very successful business in Scotland for some time. Um, growing in Scotland, very commercially successful in Scotland, employing quite a few people in Scotland. What was the motivation to widen horizons and get into export? And what prompted that in the first place? 
Uh, thanks, Martin. Thanks for having me along today. Um, the, the the driver was, like you say, we've been quite successful, established in 1983, so got quite a number of years under our belt. Mm. Um, we, in 2017, we uh, set out to develop a five-year strategy uh, that, with a key focus on the objective to uh, hit 50, mil 50 million pounds worth of sales by 2021. Mm -hmm. And we looked at our home market and we looked at the demand, potential demand for equipment in our home market in Scotland and discovered that we were probably not going to achieve that, that our ambition, the scale of our ambition was was a lot uh, larger than uh, what we were, we were going to achieve in Scotland. So that's where um, we set about seeking the, look, looking at the three uh, identifying three drivers for our strategy. One was innovation, uh, one was import substitution, and the final one was uh, interna internationalization, so export. Um, we also knew that a number of our customers in Scotland had sites across uh, the world, and aquaculture is uh, a global uh, business as well. So it, it seemed like a no-brainer to us to, to look into that a bit further. Yeah. And having made that commitment and, and I suppose set up the, the basis of that three-pronged strategy, what prompted you or how did you go about the process of deciding where to export? Because obviously aquaculture is an international business. What prompted that decision? So we we looked at the, we, when we were looking at uh, export and we, uh, First of all, we didn't set out just to pick one market or pick several markets. That wasn't the, the way to do it. We were going to do it in a, a methodical manner. And um, that was really, really needed to go through the process by identifying the criteria of what that uh, market selection was going to be like. Um, and also to keep our team of uh, directors clear and focused on what the, what the commitment to export was going to be rather than kind of going down a rabbit hole of just picking and choosing, as you call it, Martin, shiny things, you know, a, an opportunity comes up in an export market somewhere and just picking off at that. So it was to keep that yeah. focus. So our first step was to identify our criteria for the market selection. We um, we sat down, we had a session as a team uh, to develop a, a clear criteria uh, for our market screening exercise. That was to look at the... Um, the different information we would need in order to give us a, a really well informed uh, choice and what the what the right market would be for us. Mm -hmm. That was a number of a number of different things, such as uh, fish farm sites in our country, uh, fish production volumes, for example, future produ production plans in different markets as well. Um, once we had done that and established the different types of criteria that we needed to look at to give us that informed decision, we, or I, <laughs> did the desk research, uh, which was a screening research uh, done from the office. So that was a lot of hard work and uh, back and forth, looking at different journals, looking at different websites, industry websites, trade websites, uh, to uh, drill into the, the, the criteria that we were focusing on. So... Um, looking at a number of different markets that we were uh, potentially could be looking at and identifying what the opportunity was in each of those markets. Mm -hmm. That was, it was then a case of coming back to the table for a second session with the team and presenting that, uh, that desk research data that we had done up on screen. And as a team, really thinking about what it was, what was our, you know, it was a combination of capability and opportunity rather than just going for the, the, the biggest prize as we found out. So just as an example, um, Norway is the biggest um, the biggest market in the in the in the world for uh, for farmed salmon. Seems like the most on the face of it the most logical place to go to because it's the biggest uh, there's going to be lots lots of opportunity there. But in actual fact when we looked at it a bit deeper and asked ourselves the right questions we discovered that we had done a bit of a SWOT analysis. Mm. We knew we weren't innovative enough. We we were still kind of fledgling in that area. And Norway tend to uh, buy Norwegian. They're, mm. you know, a Scottish uh, company going into Norway was going to be very difficult to crack. So that quite quickly got us move, you know, thinking in a different direction. And we actually ended up settling on a, 
uh, on on the east coast of Canada, which is quite a specific area for aquaculture, mm. based on the fact that we knew that there was it was a kind of mid range growing market. There was really good opportunity. We had heard lots from our uh, our own contacts in Scotland that there was um, lots of licenses were up for grabs in in Newfoundland in uh, particular, in Canada. Um, so we settled on that as being our priority market, and also had Spain and Iceland as two potential markets as well that we would uh, park for the time being, but still do a little bit of research um, yeah. uh, later on. And, and did that process where you, alert, I guess, engaged with the team to set those criteria and then bring the analysis back to the team, help bring them on board with the commitment needed collectively to, to drive for the growth in Canada and when you started to enter the market? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, we 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 ended up doing a, a significant amount of more research after mm. after we'd identified Canada, and we, you know, so there was a validation aspect. So, just because we'd selected that doesn't mean didn't mean we were going to go straight uh, knee, deep, knee deep into it. We had to do a bit more research, and we also had to do the, the run a few market visits as well. Um, we had a really good contact in Canada that we were we had a, a number of questions that we that remained unanswered. Mm -hmm. So we set him, uh, he was a contact in Newfoundland, and we set him a, a task of answering 13 to 14 questions that he would um, he would give us a report on, really trying to drill in to the, mm -hmm. the, the specific opportunities that were, were out there in Newfoundland. We then got feet in the ground, did a number of visits. We got a membership with the local um, aquaculture association there as well, um, who hooked, it up, hooked us up with a number of customers and got us really kind of connected really well. And what we also found is that we, because we'd done our homework when we were, when we were on the ground, we, uh, it wasn't a case of coming across that we knew what we were talking about. We did know what we were talking about. So we, we'd, because we'd done the research, it didn't look like we were just coming in from Scotland just to take a, a market share and not, you know, just and, and take it all the way back to Scotland. We were we were genuinely in it to do inward investment and genuinely in it to help their industry grow mm. and take what we had learned from Scotland into into Canada and help them grow their industry. Um, well, your your market research was used to to help build that credibility. Yes. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that credibility, I think, got you a couple of key speaking invitations at, at industry events. I think they were so impressed. Yeah. So the, the kind of final piece mm -hmm. of the jigsaw of that validation exercise was we we, we had uh, attended a trade show um, in September 2018 mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to secure a couple of uh, speaking slots. We had a trade stand there mm -hmm. and it was basically everybody and anybody who's involved in that industry were attending that trade show and it was we again we didn't we didn't just go into half-hearted we made a serious effort we wanted we we hired a, a massive space um it was it was a bit of a kind of a, 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 an exhibition or trade show in a hotel so it wasn't much to shout about but we did as best as we possibly can with that we ran a really good pr campaign as well we made sure that people knew we were coming um and on the back of that we were able to get attract people to our stand to ask even more questions and set ourselves up nicely for the for the future uh, in terms of you know, potential sales leads and talking to the the real decisions to decision makers in that market. Yeah. I mean, one of the discussions that that goes on in lots of companies, and it did initially in Gale Force too, is that decision between going wide and talking about how many markets you sell to versus going deep and narrow. Um, and you've gone deep and narrow by picking the market and committing to that. Has it generated the commercial success that you wanted to achieve? Yeah. So we. We I think in the first year we had um, over the five year term we had looked to achieve around eight point seven million pounds mm -hmm. worth of turnover. That's where we're in, in the fifth year of the plan. Um, mm -hmm. In the first year of the plan we were aiming for around two million pounds turnover. So we'd we'd kind of gone in there what we thought was reasonably ambitious, and we actually ended up surpassing that quite substantially. We ended up with a. a and it came through a lot of hard work and back and forth trips to. To Canada, we ended up with a massive contract to build feed barges out in um, in Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. uh, which ended up being uh, something in the region of a thirty million dollar contract over 
five five years for nine barges, mm-hmm. um, subject to conditions, of course. We ended up in the first year in 2019, um, setting up in Canada. We've got a premises in Newfoundland, right in the heart of it, uh, of it all. And we, at the end of the year, we were something like six million pounds uh, worth of uh, sales uh, that were, were, were done. So we super, surpassed all our expectations. But I really do put that down to the fact that we were, narrow, not, like you say, narrow, narrow, narrow focus on Canada, really mm. drilling down and doing the, the re- research, not just doing one desk research exercise, mm. doing two, two proper exercises, really validating the market, uh, mm. visiting, getting feet in the ground, um, and rounding it off with that trade show. It was, it was every single time it was a bit, we kind of kept on asking ourselves the question, are we there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? But, uh, and, and eventually we, we came to that conclusion in, in yeah. September, you know, and that was it. We're, we're, we're nearly out of time, but what's next? On the, I mean, I know the answer to that, but what, what's the next horizon from an export perspective then? So I mentioned Norway earlier. We, we, at the time, we'd say we, were, we weren't innovative enough and uh, we, we didn't feel we were ready to go into that. So we've had that time, that bit of time learning curve to really um, consider Norway as our next uh, option. Uh, last year we were at a Norwegian exhibition, which we which we um, made a big deal of, uh, and ended up getting a lot of uh, really good feedback from Norway, telling us a bit to the contrary of what we believed. Which a lot of the Norwegian and big Norwegian companies were telling us actually we do want you to come into Norway or we do need international presence. Mm-hmm. So that gave us a bit of a, a bit of an eye opener, um, and uh, that's that's next on the card. So we're 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 you know we feel like we've got the right blueprint for what we've done with Canada and mm-hmm. uh, we can build on that and do the same do the same for Norway but we do realize that we've got we've, this is going to be a much harder task it's a bigger market more fragmented um, and we do need to go into the market with something that's mm-hmm. going to be innovative rather than just um, expecting to be given up. There's an argument there for saying not necessarily picking the hardest one first so Canada has been successful but also a great learning experience in Norway is now a bigger challenge Absolutely. with the experience of Canada behind it. Okay, yeah. thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm going to have to move on. Um, and and as I do that, actually, I, I should have done something which was show you very briefly, um, just to, to make it real, um, what does Gale Force uh, do? And, and people may be aware of this from driving around the countryside, may see um, fish farms on their travels in the locks and in, in, in Scotland. So that's what Gale Force does from on the right hand side of the screen, the feed barge um, with all of the cages um, and all of the piping systems for delivering feed in, into those cages. And then all of the technology piece, which is uh, data collection, seal detection, lighting, underwater cameras. Um, so there's, a, there's an engineering piece and there's a technology component that, that comes together to build an integrated fish farm system. So Fleming Agri Products, um, again, to show you what Fleming does, um, agricultural machinery for not just small, medium farmers, but um, a range of, of uh, agri applications. And the company is building business successfully in Scotland, uh, particularly actually, in fact, one of um, Fleming's customers is out the backyard behind Gale Force's site, which is Highland Industrial Supplies, um, but also a much more uh, widely around the world. And maybe my opening question, George, is in fact, maybe give people a flavor for the markets that you've opened up and developed over the last number of years, George. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I suppose, you know, we, we also started in 1983 and uh, initially uh, our initial plans were basically just survival. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the first 10 years, that was basically what it was. and. Uh, from the early mid '90s, we started to expand out, and we were initially we were just supplying uh, to Northern Ireland, and uh, because I'm born and bred in Donegal in the, in the Republic of Ireland, I didn't see uh, selling to the Republic of Ireland as that much a difficulty, or even seeing it as an export. But technically, that's what it was, because in those days, we still had the uh, we still had the border and the customs thing to deal with. Uh, so we gradually, uh, as we developed our product range, we were developing, widening out our, uh, our, our markets. And uh, so we just gradually went from one county to another county. Initially, we just set off trying to achieve Dublin to, Gal- Dublin to Galway. And then uh, we eventually got to Cork. 
and it was where do we go from there? Uh, and in the mid 80s, early 90s, and still to this day, there is a, a strong second hand trade uh, for farm machinery go, coming from Scotland to, uh, to Northern Ireland. And we found this is a great uh, method of research of finding you know, potential customers to go to because we were talking to our Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland customers who were dealing in second hand tractors in Scotland. And that gave us uh, an easy opportunity to actually get into to what we saw as export, even though we were still in the UK, but we had to drive an hour and a half up the road and then two hours in a boat and then we were in Scotland. And we basically, we gradually started at Stranraer and worked our way north until we ended up being in Orkney and Shetland. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you say, like we, we now deal with uh, HIS and Ravenhill, uh, Geddes, Garricks, HRM, Walter, Walter Grant, Braywick and STM Shetland. Like those are all regular customers of ours. Uh, so actually to, to extend, as, as we were looking to extend our, our export market, uh, we were looking at the UK and in uh, late 90s, early 2000, around 2000, we got the opportunity of uh, forming an alliance with a Northern, Northern, Northern Ireland company where the, where the products didn't conflict. Uh, so a company called NC and ourselves, uh, we shared a customer or we shared a salesperson, you know, for about seven or eight years. And that really worked well and got us established into the UK market. And we're in the mid 90s, we had one salesperson and which covered all our sales and marketing and research, etc. Uh, now we have eight in the sales and marketing team, uh, which is covering uh, all the UK. And we're now uh, fairly well established in Australia and New Zealand and uh, getting starting to get into Australia, into the USA. We've uh, just confirmed our second container to go to USA uh, this week. So we'll be hopefully be expanding out on that. And, and a bit like, like Gale Force, I mean, you, your business was growing substantially in UK and Ireland, which, you know, as we've talked before, really are the home markets. But what's, what was the driver and the catalyst to really take on uh, export, especially given that some of that exports in the Southern Hemisphere and this far away and quite challenging? Well, um, I suppose um, we've always had a we've always had a desire to challenge ourselves and to uh, develop ourselves to uh, the best of our comfort zone. And uh, as we keep, we we always try to create the demand and then build the capacity. You know, slightly ahead of, of for capacity. Mm -hmm. And every but every time we built capacity, we tended to eat it up on the home market. So we were developing that. And we also soon learned that you know, going out to sell a product was quite difficult. When you go out to sell a range of product, you can block a lot of your competition out. Mm -hmm. And over this past number of years now, we have developed our, uh, into a niche market, uh, basically a, a, a unique industry offering uh, where we would, over several different market sector segments, uh, we offer a complete range of product mm -hmm. and that allows uh, our customers who want to buy a bale lifter, a trailer, a yard scraper, a transport box, a vacuum tanker, a muck spreader, uh, they can get the complete range from us. Mm -hmm. So when you see a delivery going out of our, uh, of our yard, there could be 15 or 20 different products on it at any one time. Yeah. And, you know, you, you talk about uh, why do we go as far as uh, Australia or New Zealand. Well, Australia, New Zealand, USA, they all speak English. Their laws are basically formed on UK laws. Uh, their accounting systems are much the same. Uh, so it's actually, it's quite easy to communicate with them, even though they are quite far away. Yeah. Plus, when we fill a container here uh, and send it to New Zealand, it's two and a half thousand pounds. Uh, we fill a lorry here and send it to the West Country in England. It's probably 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. And we can get a lot more packed into a container because our, our, uh, our importers in New Zealand and, and Australia, as they say, they don't want any fresh air in the container. So because we've got a, a, a quite a wide mix of product, 
we can put in big products and then fill in around it with small products and build the value up on the container. They're probably quite ingenious at packing, all right. Uh, can I uh, flip it around the other way uh, and say, you know, and it's quite characteristic of everybody around the screen. What are some of the, the challenges, or, or do we see them as challenges of building what is a significant export business in quite a peripheral region? Because I mean, where we're sitting now and we're not far away from each other. Um, we're in a what would be considered a peripheral region, as are some of the other guys. What are some of the challenges of getting over that? Well, there, there's certainly a challenge in the fact that where we are, we're you know 40, 50 miles from the nearest dual carriageway or motorway. Uh, all the uh, the main stockists stockists of our raw materials and components are either in Belfast, 80 miles away, or in Dublin, 150 miles away. But we also see that as uh, see that as an, as an opportunity, you know, because if if we were based in Belfast, you know, the land that we would need to buy, the, the size of the site would cost us an absolute fortune to buy compared to buying it here. We would be competing with uh, a lot of high tech companies, you know, the likes of uh, FinTech and, and uh, Terex and, and Caterpillar, etc. Uh, so we would have to compete for staff at a much higher level. Whereas here in the Northwest, it's, uh, we tend to train the biggest end of our own staff and we have a very good working relationship with the Northwest Regional College. And we would take on between six and 10 trainees every year, bringing on uh, you know, welders, fabricators, et cetera. So that those are guys that want to stay at home. They don't want to go to university and end up in, uh, in England or wherever. Uh, they, they're quite happy staying at home and our, of, our, of our, welding, our welders, we have about 35, 40 welders. I'll guarantee 30 of them have been trained by us. Yeah. So I, I see as uh, you talk about a peripheral region, uh, again, it's, it's not that big a disadvantage, you know, mm. because when we're selling to New Zealand and Australia, we can fill the container here. We still have to get the boat, you know, so the, the main expense is on the boat. Yeah. Uh, so that's not, that's not that big a problem. Okay, I think partly it's in the head too, and, and we're used to it. Um, another question, I mean, um, how has COVID impacted on the whole export process and the journey in terms of either the perception of customers being impacted or the practicalities of doing it? Well, I suppose at the start of this year, um, in which we were talking to yourselves, you know, in our marketing sales and marketing plans, and we had a full itinerary of shows laid mm -hmm. out for ourselves. We had, uh, you know, we had a full itinerary of market visits for Australia, New Zealand, you know, the Nordics, Europe, um, and all that got shelved. Uh, our regular salespeople, you know. Uh, calling with our, our established customers in the UK and Ireland uh, basically couldn't go out. But then that was the same for everyone. Mm. So we were all competing on, on a different level. Mm. And um, other than the, the initial three weeks in the start of April, uh, we were basically, we've been open full time other than that initial lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been able to maintain uh, our production other than that I suppose we lost a month or six weeks when you take uh, shielding letters and various other things. We lost a month or six weeks, but we kept everything. We tried to keep everything going and we had a good stock at the start of the year. Mm -hmm. Now, initially, we had quite a bit of uh, work to do with, you know, getting our uh, factory markings and shielding and putting up perspex uh, uh, screens, you know, to protect the staff, making sure everyone is wearing masks, put up extra washing facilities. Uh, closing the gates, not allowing, like we really don't want uh, salespeople coming in to see us. Lorry drivers, we expect to stay, we try to keep them sitting in their cabs. And other than that, you know, we have worked quite well through it. So we've, we've sort of learned to work with, mm -hmm. and we've had a life within COVID rather than, you know, combating it. And, and the, the agri market has been pretty resilient, I think. Well, um, yes, you know, well, if you look, um, we're, we're quite an old established family business. Like I'm the fourth generation of my family. My son's in the business as a fifth generation. Uh, and if you look through the years, 
you know, we've dealt with BSE, foot and mouth, the troubles, First World War, Second World War. Uh, there, there have been quite a lot of things that have affected it. But, yeah. you know, uh, without trying to sound too blasé about it, you know, we all got eight. And uh, we're, we're in, the, even though we're an engineering facility, we're in the food processing business, you know, so everything that we make uh, has, a, has a, a, an effect uh, or has a, an efficient working relationship with food production. Doesn't matter whether you're a vegan or a meat eater or whatever, yeah. you know, so uh, our products are all in the, in, in the food processing industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, what's the, there were seven, the world population is 7.7 7 billion, I think now. And yeah. I reckon it's going to go to eight or 10 billion by 2050. So that's a lot of people to feed. I can only do a few. And Gale Force will help you with a little bit more as well. Okay, George, thank you. Yeah, yeah. We can widen it out. And they can do the fish course. In, indeed. <laughs> we'll widen it out. And Martin will do the gin after, but we'll talk to him in a wee while. Um, okay, thank you. We'll, we'll have some more questions, I suspect, from around the screen in a wee while. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Jamie and, and to show you a just quick visual impression of, of what Jamie does. And this is only a little bit. I know he does other things as well. But the essence of Harris brand comes from Harris, as, as it says. And I suppose this montage of photographs shows a little bit of the sense of place and where he's from and the Glasgow store and some of the products. Uh, so quite a change from that food supply chain and, and the slightly more engineering aspect of the food supply chain to, to an entirely different product offering, but equally very important in terms of the peripheral regions of Scotland. And, and I suppose my opening question for Jimmy is, really about the importance of place to your brand and the provenance of the brand and how that travels globally. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be here this afternoon. Thanks for having me, Martin. Um, yeah, for ourselves, I mean, you know, Martin, you've spent time with me before. I mean, we are extremely proud and extremely passionate about our island home, you know. Once you feel the sand between your toes on the Isle of Harris, you never create a memory like that again. That's you, you're... I don't... I. We'll argue with anyone that say they don't feel a special moment when they feel Harris under their toes. Um, and for us, we wanted to try to create that memory that, you know, when people are off island or overseas, whatever, we can still gift them that product that helps them keep thinking about Harris and the quality of life that Harris brings. It's not just a holiday or a vacation or whatever. It's, it's a way of life. It's, and Harris is one of the islands in the country that carries that stamp of heritage, provenance, quality, because Harris Tweed set the path out for as many decades ago, you know. Yeah. So for us, it was, and the other great thing about what we do is it runs out the same as Martin's Gin. So people, if they love it, they need to buy it again. So that, that was also very, very important to me that we created something that people use, but also that it runs out and they have to reuse it again because anybody can create a business anywhere in the world that you can sell something to somebody once. Um, you know, our repeat business figures are over 40% on our website. Wow. You know, that's that's strong for yeah. us. And that's the only reason that our business has been allowed mm -hmm. to grow and develop is because people support us. And mm -hmm. we're extremely, extremely thankful for that. And the other guys that spoke before me, you know, spoke with great passion and endeavour and what they're doing and things, but they missed one key point out in you have to have the crack along the way, you know. It has to be fun. You have, yeah. to enjoy, you have to enjoy the journey. It has to be good because we're there's enough, you know, we have to work hard and we have to give everything we've got to our journey, but we need to enjoy it. Like, yeah. it's paramount. Yeah. No, and, and, and your your social media, for example, demonstrates that all the time. It's the, it's the, the life. In fact, I, I should say, and, and we had this chat yesterday with George, that, you couldn't possibly cover anything in 10 or 12 minutes. So, so there are parts of it. Uh, George keeps all the crack parts of private conversations. <laughs> we'll maybe cover that later on. Um, yeah. Okay, but you know, you're, you're even more peripheral than the rest, but one of the advantages you have is maybe that peripherality is completely overcome by the, the name recognition your, your island has around the world. Yeah, I mean, you could be in the most remote part of the world and... Mm -hmm mention Harris and they know Harris Tweed, as I mentioned. So, and then yeah. we've, we've got the new worldwide phenomenon, which has been Harris Gin yeah. as well, and the gin industry as well. So it's yeah. much like Martin's Gin, it's 
picked up and it's ran across the universe with it and they're in many, many countries throughout the world. So for mm. us, it helped to make Harris a little bit relevant again. And then Essence of Harris came on the scene and we've been, you know, we're quite quirky about the way we do things. We have a young dynamic team that work here because, you know, as long as I've got a good strategy and a focus on where we're taking it, the young people that we surround ourselves with, they've got that fear of failure that makes us sort of pretty ambitious and pretty dedicated and also makes us pretty bulletproof really yeah. because we surround, surround ourselves with really intelligent, highly motivated young people that just, yeah. you know, these this team has achieved amazing things from our, you know, let's not forget we're a population of 1916 people, yeah. you know, yeah. and we're not taking one brand, we're taking three brands and internationally nearly, you know. Yeah. And, and I suppose, I mean, what, what have the challenges been of doing that with, with that such a small population with, with you know, breaking that barrier and getting out there and, and yeah. uh, even further? <laughs> Funnily enough, the biggest challenge that we have is not around getting people to move to the island to come and work with us, about mm -hmm. getting the right people, about getting the right skill set, about developing it. The biggest challenge we have got is housing on the island for people to come to. Yeah. There's not enough housing and there's not enough affordable housing on the island. And mm. that is the big barrier that we've got. So we've, you know, we've even now purchased some land on the island that we hope to build affordable houses for young people in the next five years. Mm. You know, so we have to be able to, and that's why we've got the construction and facilities management company. Mm. We try along our journey to protect and sustain what the journey is going to be so that we can mm. build our dreams with our own hands and our own vision. Yeah. You know, so we're just, trying along the way, but housing's been a big part of it. You mm. know, we've attracted some incredible young graduates to the business. Every single one of them's got a full-time job at the end of their time. And you've mm. you've spent time with Beth, yeah. one of the first ones in the door. So you know how impressive these young people are, Martin, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's interesting because one of the reasons I, I wanted to gather this group around the screen was the, the fact that the, the importance these businesses have to sustaining local economies and communities and, and that's a perfect example of it there and actually building housing for people to come and work for you and um, you, you've you've gone east and west you've had successes in america recently with that um new york now digital um award you've you've been promoting your chinese activity over the last couple of days um has the the, the sense of place has the harris recognition helped break all of that out for you or, or what else has, has been required to make that successful? Yeah, I mean, the, we had decided that America, not just America, but New York was the place for us. And we spent 18 months developing our strategy for New York before we showcased it New York now in January this year. Very fortunate a few weeks ago that we won Best Emerging Brand in New York at New York now, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, plus last year I was lucky enough like Martin to win director of the year for institute of directors so these sort of things platform you yeah. and giving you opportunities you otherwise wouldn't have had because mm -hmm. you know the other thing that we really need to grasp and, and understand is that the only reason that everybody on this call is successful at what they do is not because we're all wonderfully talented people it's because of our network mm -hmm. we've created good strong networks that help us like for us Scottish Business Network's been a phenomenal backup to us, HIE, SDI, places like that that help us, plus people that we know personally. Yeah. And it's these networks and these conversations that you have off the cuff sometimes that come back yeah. to just basically give real fruit. So concentrating on New York, mm. and we were digging in deep there, doing really well, it's been going great, we got really good success there in, in retail. And then we're going down to the Carolinas next um, and concentrating mm. on them. And then China came to us, which sort of blew me away. Um, they approached us. Somebody, a fashion brand in China had seen the brand and they fell in love with it. Yeah. They contacted us. I said we weren't ready for China. They offered to fund making the videos and doing stuff for us and things mm -hmm. because they wanted to work with us and get our brand there so much. Yeah. So we took a little toe in the water with them and we've built an amazing relationship with them now. And, you know hand in hand, both places are just picking up nice momentum for us now and we're very, very yeah. fortunate. We will not try to go much further at the moment. Yeah. We will concentrate, dig deep in where we are just now with these two relationships mm -hmm. um, and really 
there's no point running all over the place when there's a lot more um, ability to pull more out of where we are at the moment, especially mm. in New York. If we can really sustain ourselves in New York and then on the back in New York, one of the biggest fashion brands in America, mm. um, Anastasia Beverly Hills, come on to us and asked if she could stock our products in her Beverly Hills salons. Mm-hmm. So we've now got our candles that were being made in a kitchen in the Isla Harris five and a half years ago, sitting in the middle of eight salons in Beverly Hills. Brilliant. So it's, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Very, very fortunate. We're very fortunate indeed. But, but you've also been very good at, at um, using the publicity of those successes to, to fuel further success then as you've been going along. It's a new world we live in. Yeah. You know, we yeah. use Instagrammers, bloggers, a network of people that can promote our brand by. But mm-hmm. the one thing that you have to remember when people are promoting and you're promoting your brand, Mm-hmm. Your products have to be good or you're falling your face. Yeah. You know, the fact that our products are good, people don't want to promote brands that are rubbish or the mm-hmm. quality's not there or they're not sustainable, they're not ethical. Mm-hmm. So for us, you know, it's an evolving process, but we're working towards being that brand that is flying the flag as a Scottish luxury fragrance and home living brand. And there's mm-hmm. a real gap in the market to be filled and we want to be the company that does that. Mm-hmm. We want to be that brand that people leave the house mm-hmm. and say, oh, yeah, I want to be, I want that Joe Malone candle. Don't like that because that's just for when the visitors come. You know, we want we want that essence of Harris to be the brand that people aspire to have in their living room. Yeah. But we also want to keep it at a price point that they can afford to burn it and enjoy it. Yeah, and come back for more. Absolutely. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Listen, we, we'll move on and we'll, there'll be loads of questions, I'm sure, um, about Paris, about the successes, yeah. about the learnings. Uh, Thanks very much. Listen, Aoife, there's a, there's a little poll that, that there's a question Eva wants to throw out there to everybody about your perceptions of export. And uh, if you do that now, um, people can answer that question and uh, and just share some thoughts. But we'll, we'll maybe share the results in a wee while because um, what I want to do is, is move on and talk to Philip. Um, and when it, as I do that, if I can share screen, I think I can still share screen um, while Aoife's doing that, yes. <clears throat> and I want to just give you a quick visual of, of what Philip does. Um, in fact, I'm going to stop sharing for a second to change the presentation. Um, here it starts. Because Philip was good enough to send me a couple of pictures. I, I've, I've um, Brought it down. So coastal defence, sea defences, slipway construction, jetty and pontoons. But the bit that I think everybody might be most interested in is a wee map of where where does Philip work? 80% of the company's turnover um, over the last three years has been actually in Scotland from the the Kirkcubbon base in Northern Ireland. And just some really nice pictures of the range of work done. Breakwaters in Inishmore, uh, which is in Ireland. Um, and then uh, Greystones on the east coast of Ireland. Um, and Mark might be interested in these because you could put some great pontoons and marina uh, facilities inside those breakwaters. Um, and an airport that I haven't been to half enough in 2020, only once actually, which is Sumbra on Shetland. Um, and hopefully we'll be back to you in the near future. And then also um, a, a, a project in um, Peterhead, which is a primary fishing port in Scotland, and then extension works into Aberdeen Harbour. There's a big project going on there. So that gives you a fee for the work that um, Ashley Contracts does. Um, Aoife, the poll, is it finished? Yeah, that's it. Can you see the results there? It's on the screen. So what are the, uh, what do you think the biggest challenges in building a sustainable and recurring export business are? Establishing an understanding of the export market um, comes out as the top. Um, finding the right partners, absolutely. And I suppose finding or establishing that understanding is is one of the things that Mark emphasised and, and not just doing the initial research to pick the market, but going deep into establishing real insights and then in fact using that knowledge in order to build credibility amongst the network of people that they started to engage with in, in those markets. So, you know, as a phrase I've used with a few people in the past, is market research becomes a tool or even a weapon to be used in your market entry process to build that credibility. And we'll talk to Martin particularly about building partners um, in a wee while, but both of those are challenges, but challenges that can obviously be perfectly uh, overcome. So Philip, thanks for joining us.
Um, I, I went through those photographs quite quickly, but they're they're uh, great visuals. You obviously have a drone uh, that you can use to, to take those those pics. A um, couple of questions, I suppose. I, I really was going to ask you how important Scotland is. It's eighty percent of your business, pretty much. Uh, why did you? Why have you built the business so strongly over there from your Northern Ireland base? I think really uh, the way we're quite specialised in terms of what we like to do. Jamie talked about uh, liking the feel of the sand, looking at his feet. Uh, we are something similar. We don't like to be too far from the water, and uh, Scotland has a great coastline. And Mother Nature has a great habit of uh, testing that coastline and testing the structures that are either within a harbour or any new harbours that are to be built. And to be fair, most of the infra infrastructure projects in recent years have been across in Scotland. Mm. So really, uh, we have, we've really chased the work and that's how we have ended up in Scotland over the last number of years. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Way back in 2008, it was prim prim primarily Ireland. We're out in the Iron Islands, we're down Greystones. But in recent years, most of the action in terms of marine civil engineering infrastructure projects has been in Scotland. So we've we've just wanted to be part of that. And, and I mean, an interesting question, which, which I hadn't put on the in, in briefed you in advance, but let me launch it anyway. Which is, does the island of Ireland have we underdeveloped our coastal infrastructure and the economic opportunity that it creates? No, not not overly. No, there were some major infrastructure projects in 2000 and, well, 2007 through to 2011. Most of the work was in Ireland uh, with the decline in the economy at that stage. A lot of those projects were shelled, so we had to re-divert our attention. There is more focus back into the marine sector in Ireland, and we are starting to see more tender inquiries coming through for the type of work we do and for the coastal defence uh, type of work. But uh, Ireland's quite a competitive market as well, so it's hard enough to pick up the work back in Ireland. So yeah. really, from our perspective, Scotland has been much more easy to concentrate on and uh, just to have, remain and have a presence and a focus there. How is the, build, the business built in Scotland? Is it a relationships important or does it come down to that tendering thing you mentioned just now? It, it comes down mostly to tendering, but also relationships uh, in terms of main contractors that we have worked for in the past. Mm. Uh, that do invite us back and clients for that respect for that matter have invited us back mm. and in some cases it's nice to be brought onto a project because they know you can do the job for them where where we're where we are in Aberdeen at the moment is the, is the testament to that yeah. we're Aberdeen Harbour we're working directly for the harbour board there uh, finishing up a, a breakwater yeah. and really invited back onto that project by them so it's, it's good to good to have that invite yes. good to have that respect yeah and is networking really important in your experience in Scotland being kind of part of the fabric of what's going on in your sector? Probably in our sector it's slightly difficult for us in that we're a specialist subcontractor mm -hmm. so we can't really the size we're at we're not uh, um, chasing the overall project it's one particular aspect of them so it's networking more with the main contractors uh, as opposed to uh, clients and so forth at this time but one thing is the company does develop and grow further forward we might be, decide to become slightly less specialist and to try and broaden our horizon with regards to the, the scope of work that we undertake so we can actually take more of the work on as a main contractor ourselves. Okay. And in that respect, it will be more important as we grow to increase our networking with the, the uh, infrastructure providers in Scotland. Yeah. And in terms of your model, and uh, apart from widening the scope of works, do you have a base in Scotland or are you constantly having to move over and back? We're constantly moving uh, back and forward. You know, once we are established on a project, we try and focus on and uh, target projects that are very close by, and at least we retain our plant there, capability there, our plant base there. Mm -hmm. But really, yeah. most of our people, our core people, are from Northern Ireland. They're long established uh, and long term employees that we move backwards and forwards as, yeah. as the job dictates and demands. Yes. And, and how, from Northern Ireland base, even though you're probably there a lot, how do you keep in, uh, informed on intelligence and what's happening on the ground uh, from okay, a no. slightly remote base? No, we're, we're using web-based systems for nearly everything. Mm. Uh, and we've had to, uh, from a contractual point of view, to keep ourselves covered in mm. contractual disputes. Everything's all about uh, evidence. Mm. And really, we've learned over the years that we need every member of our team to provide us with evidence. And that comes down to we have a daily reporting system that the guys log on to and literally fill in a diary. So each each and every one of our team fill in a diary and noting what, they, what they've done, what they see, load up, upload photographs and so forth. So from a perspective of uh, having to defend yourself down the line, it's, a, it's incredible what 
level of detail that you can pull upon fairly quickly. So from that point of view, we're able to keep a, a very close eye on what is happening, not only what we're doing, what other contractors are doing on site. And we're also using that same system for inducting our team in terms of health and safety and environmental aspects and also daily checks of the plant. So that's all recorded online. So that, that's an extremely useful tool for us and just makes it that bit easier to manage from a central source. And, and do they keep you informed a wee bit of jumble drums of, of what's going on and in, in, in new contract opportunities and things like that? They do as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how important is air connectivity to you in that constant movement over and back? Well, it, it has been. Obviously, when we were working in Shetland, the only way there and back was... Uh, Fly B. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. we made extensive use of, of that. And up until yeah. Fly B's demise, you know, our annual expenditure with Fly B would have been 28 to 30,000 pounds a year in the last two or three years to actually get our guys uh, there and back. And what they tend to do is work on a fortnightly uh, rota basis where they're on site for 10 days and home for four. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often the, the quickest way is to jump in a van, get back to Edinburgh Airport and uh, get the nearest flight home. Yeah. Since Flybee's demise and with the COVID uh, situation, we've actually found that it's now uh, probably more flexible for us to use the uh, Stranraer, sorry, the Cairn Round route, the uh, Denner mm. route. So the guys, when they do finish a shift, a tidal shift pattern, jump in the van, drive back down to Cairn Ryan and, and home that way. So they've actually found yeah. it a lot more flexible. They don't have to be waiting mm. for specific times of the day for flights and so forth. So. Uh, mm -hmm. From that point of view, going forward, we'll probably make more use of the uh, ferry service than going back mm -hmm. onto Flybe or going back onto the replacement for Flybe. Well, especially with with schedules being thinned down a bit, you're more you've more waiting time, and, and there are so many boat, more boats every day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, will Will Brexit create any challenges? I haven't used the B word uh, yet, but will that create difficulty with you in terms of moving across the North Channel? Oh, hopefully not overly. We're not moving product. We're really uh, yeah. moving our services and our people. So hopefully from that respect, there might be some slowdown of when we take plant across, somebody will want to check whether it's, it's being exported for sale or not. But hopefully yeah. uh, Brexit, as far as we're concerned, we're more concerned about yeah. uh, what clients will be doing in terms of their infrastructure yeah. uh, compared to what our difficulties might be moving about the country. Yeah, no, that's fair. Okay, thank you. Um, as with everybody, I think you'll, you'll encounter quite a few questions as we go through. Um, but there's one point I just want to pick up, Ethan, you, you responded to it on chat, but Jim Dolan, <clears throat> pardon me, asked a question, made a comment or an observation about the importance if we're exporting a power a differentiator. And I think it's interesting just to go back to Mark's point earlier about let's not do Norway because we're not innovative enough. Um, actually, in fact, Gale Force in its three-pronged strategy, I think Mark said, had uh, innovation, import substitution, and internationalization as the third step, which is let's get innovative, let's develop that differentiator and make sure that we're really competitive and have a strong message on an international stage before jumping into it. Um, and I think that's uh, an important point. Um, so sometimes we, we might want to, but we just might not be ready. Uh, I guess George's point was the differentiator part is having a broad product range and it makes it more attractive to the dealer than to have a, a competitive complete range to offer, offer the, the customer. Um, okay, I, I want to um, move on and to talk to our final speaker. Um, and Martin will say, of course, well, I've left the best to last, but um, I, I'll say it before he jumps in and says it. Um, let me just show you this slide. Um, this is the product. I had two bottles arrive yesterday afternoon, beautifully packaged in a very short delivery time, very, very quick. So they're not paid distilleries, um, producers at Rock Are you Road. Sorry, there. So, oh, sorry, is it not? Can't see it, yes, yeah. <laughs> I do apologize. Um, me talking rubbish. And there we go. Now it's there. Um, let me just put it up on the screen. Now I'm everybody should see not, it. I'm sure you've not drunk okay. that two bottles already, Martin. Is that very <laughs> Yes, I was lying to you earlier when I said I didn't have the gym here. I do have it quietly under the desk. Um, intravenously, Mark. Uh, no, this is the, the Rock Rose Gin product and Holy Grass Vodka with, a little, with all of the awards that this product has uh, won or the product range has won. And, and as Jimmy said, those awards, those recognitions can be terribly important in, in the brand traveling into export markets. And just to give you a quick snapshot of some of those export markets, there are several in there. I think the 13 potentially, number 13 is Spain. 
but there are, that gives you a quick smattering of the range of export markets that the company has built its brand and its presence in. And if I can come to the, some of the questions maybe that we'd like to explore, um, you know, when, when you and uh, your wife Claire set up the company in 2014, you know, was there a clear vision about what you wanted to create and was exporting central to that at that stage? Not really, actually. Um, I, George made a good point about business when, in the early days where you want to survive. We had a business plan back in 2013 where we knew what we, we wanted the business to look like. Um, but actually behind that, the real sort of driver for us was to create two jobs, one for me and one for Claire, and for that to pay the bills. And that was really not in the business plan, but that's what we wanted the business to do. But within that business plan, yeah, we did have clear objectives. We had things like um, we wanted to export um, within year three. Um, we wanted to be in London in year two. Um, we wanted to have a presence outside of the Highlands within the first year. So we were new to the industry. Um, I worked in oil and gas. Claire worked in events and hospitality. So we set fairly, um, I would say, low expectations for what we could achieve but we wanted to find our feet. We wanted to grow the business. We wanted to have the control of the growth. And that's where our business plan was written. Mm -hmm. um, now, what happens is some things um, in life happen that you're all right with your control. So before we launched, we won the best launch design at the World Gin Awards. So mm -hmm. immediately we were on other people's radars and we've not even made a bottle of gin. We had this stunning bottle. It was, um, at the time, it was, we were the second or third small craft gin distillery in Scotland. And we had this iconic bottle that people fell in love with overnight. And we really went out there and kind of changed what gin was about in a way. We, we started with the, by, by making a gin bottle something really attractive. Um, and that's, that just changed things altogether. So um, yeah, clear objectives in the business plan, but they kind of went out the window. But when it comes to then picking those markets, there were quite a few. Um, have you chosen some and have others chosen you as the journey's developed? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, like I said, the, in the business plan, we wanted to export in year three, around about that time, we wanted to find our feet in the UK. Um, and then when we won that award, um, we got um, inquiries and suddenly we had to think, you know, do we want to say no to everybody and focus on the home market? Or are we going to miss some of the perfect partners and some of the best markets? So, I quickly then went and identified what I needed to do um, as a director to learn about the process and how we should select markets and what we should how we should actually manage this. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we had a strategy where we looked at the markets that we wanted that were we seen as being key to our business in the long term. But then we had like an off strategy strategy where if someone approached us, if they ticked criteria and it was of benefit to the business then we'd be absolutely crazy to say no. So we quickly developed that criteria. And the way that that came about actually was we had, um, I'd, done the, I'd done the kind of course in the development of my side, and then an importer from Germany contacted us and mm. I didn't feel ready. So I said, we're not quite ready yet. I have to say no. And mm. I explained my reasons. I explained that I didn't know how to export, didn't feel we had the technical capabilities with the paperwork side of things, couldn't take the credit risk and we didn't know them as a business and we hadn't done our due diligence on them. Mm -hmm. They phoned us back and said, okay, how about we help you learn how to export the paperwork side of things? We mm -hmm. take the credit risk, we arrange the logistics and we provide you with the due diligence work that you should do on exporters. So quickly that became a yes because they were picking up from our door, they were paying up front, they had a great portfolio, they demonstrated to us that they were the right type of business for us to partner with. Mm -hmm. And our export journey started in year one, not year three. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's, it's interesting um, in that you saying no led to them coming back with a whole different proposition. Um, yeah. And, and helping you through that process. And sometimes saying no is the right thing to do. Uh, and it doesn't mean it ends the discussion, it changes the discussion. Mm. Yeah, and quite often we say not right now, which mm. is different. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of, of your route to market, obviously, with that German example, partnership is critical to that. Um, I mean, what, what are the, I suppose, the, the experiences of working with partners, finding, appointing, working through the process of getting them to, I guess, 
be evangelical and committed to your brand as much as you want them to be. Yeah, that's right. And it's not, it's not quite as straightforward as that. Where we have, we, we do a very, a scoring on each market. And um, so some, some of our um, distributors will fall into the bronze category. And the bronze category for us um, means that they tick certain criteria, but they're not really a market of interest to us. But uh, they're beneficial to our, uh, to our sales. We, would, we wouldn't say no. So an example of that would be uh, Bahrain and Abu Dhabi, where um, we're never going to grow massive sales there. There is only two families that distribute in both of those regions. Um, so um, we will ship to them, but we'll not invest in marketing. We'll not try to get a share of mind with them. We'll simply sell and they'll sell in their retail outlets. But then you take it to the other extreme, which is our platinum market. So um, the USA being an example, we want a share of mind. We want them, we, we believe that's where the most potential is. Our research has um, identified that. Um, and that's where we'll invest the most money, the most time, and we'll make sure that the partner fits with us as a business and our aspirations. And it's difficult. So the additional complication you have in the US, which is different to the other markets, is there's an additional tier. So um, in Germany, for example, our importer is our distributor. But in the US, our importer then has to find distributor partners. So you have to make sure that the, the partners that they're finding match with your expectations. And then you've got to then get the share of mind, not just with the importer, you have to get the share of mind with the distributor. And the only way we find to be able to do that is to get in the market. So I've been out to the US um, four times, would have been six if it wasn't for this year. Um, and that's, again, it comes down to the scoring of the partner, where we'll spend the most time, the most money, um, and other resources which would, would help. Yeah, okay. And t picking up that US example, okay, the travel hasn't been as much as you'd have liked, but that partner is now in place and having taken the time to choose carefully, and I suppose, as they say, measure twice, cut once, you know, you've taken a lot of time to get that right. Is that generating returns with an expectation yeah absolutely absolutely up, up until this year we were um ahead of where we wanted to be we were about 20 percent up on our bottle, bottle sales in the us mm -hmm. the problem we had was and this has been our strategy in other markets is we've tried to develop a reputation in the on trade finding the best bars that could then um have our reputation associated with now that was working but now all the bars are shut so <laughs> we've had to flip and find a different way. How are we going to develop off trade sales without the help of the on trade reputation? Mm. Um, so this year, it's been a bit of a year in transition, but what we found with our partners, because we have that close relationship, uh, we've been able to do it relatively quickly and, and they're a big, big business. So to be able to get them to turn it around in under nine months, we see that as a big success and we're seeing some benefits already. Mm. And what makes you attractive to a distributor? It's, not, it's got to be a two-way street. Absolutely. So I think um, there, there's three things. There's the product itself. They love the taste. They love the look. They love the credibility um, with the awards. The second mm -hmm. thing is we did a lot of work on our pricing. So I knew that even in the UK with our business model, I knew that we would fail if we didn't hit certain volumes. But I knew that if we hit those volumes, that our pricing would stand us in good stead forever. Not quite forevermore, but for a long period of time, you wouldn't have to change a lot. And that's been the case where their export markets are attracted because our pricing is good, products good, the credibility and awards is good. And then there's the last part, which is us as individuals and our attitudes where we don't see them as being, um, we ship them the product and then um, give them a hard time for not selling enough. We start to see how can we help? What can we do? Um, and really believe that we're almost part of their business. And I think when they see that attitude, they then feel that they want to help us and want to support us and go our sales that way. It feels more like a teamwork exercise rather than we sell and we give them a hard time for not selling enough. So it's not just a functional relationship, it's genuine partnership. Yeah, we're, absolutely. We're both on the team together. Okay. And can I come back to full circle and say, you wanted to create two jobs to pay the bills. What's the team there now in terms of what have you created? Way up in the north of <laughs> We're the biggest employer in our village with 300 people, so we've got 15 staff. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably a characteristic of all of the people we've talked to today, because 
you know, we're probably all from peripheral regions and you're probably all the biggest employer in your neck of the woods, for sure. Uh, from knowing you, I would say that's the case. Um, and, and that's important, contributing back to the, the places we come from. Um, okay, thank you for that. And I'm going to throw it open. There's some questions queuing up on the chat. Aoife has another wee poll there just to get you thinking as we um, move into the open Q&A uh, panel piece, if Aoife can share that poll and launch it. Yeah, there we go. So just take a second and, and tick that um, and see um, what the answers are. Um, there's one question that's there, um, which was a question for Martin from Martina. Um, what are the what are the criteria on your scoring card for your distribution partners? If we open that up, why the people are whether well, the the, the um, poll is calculated? Yeah, I um, our scoring card and um, there's a lot around about things like the number of sales representatives they have, the areas that they cover, and uh, lighthouse accounts that they would have. So lighthouse accounts being like their best customers in terms of volume, but also in terms of prestige. Um, additional things will be um, their credit terms, simple things like we do credit scoring with um, using uh, Irons and Irons Enterprise, um, where they sit as a risk to us. Um, other things we look at is their portfolio. So you get a real sense for how good a distributor is by the brands that they keep. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be two things. It can be either they keep um, a small niche brands that are very strong um, or they've got a big portfolio with a big customer base, so they're able to serve a lot of customers. Mm -hmm. Now, we tend to focus on the smaller distributors where we get a, um, we're not really part of a catalogue, we're really like their focal gin brand. So mm -hmm. they'll only have two or three gin brands and we feel comfortable with that. Whereas some of the other distributors can have a thousand gin brands and mm -hmm. we're not comfortable with that. We don't see that as a way to build a brand. Okay. So we have all of those types of scoring um, mm -hmm. uh, and then that builds up. I've got the report. I'm happy to share a report uh, or scoring card if that helps. Okay. Well, I suspect Martina would be particularly interested in that. She's in the beer business. So right, okay. uh, she'd probably be pretty interested in having a look at that. But I, I can connect between you at, at a stage. Yeah, cool. um, not so bad. Perfect. Um, yeah, just pick up the poll. I mean, the question we asked was in a post-COVID world, assuming we get to a post-COVID world sometime soon, um, how will international business function? And as George says, we, we have to get on with it. We're going online. Um, and we've had that conversation with a number of people. We'll never travel as much as we used to. Yeah, quite a few people are of that mind. I hope we get back to some, but probably not as much. Not as much of the frivolous stuff where you just hop on a plane for things that actually on reflection really didn't need it. Uh, trade shows and exhibitions will be virtual for a long time um, and there's some good practice out there now on really good online virtual events and the technology platforms to make them less agricultural and quite slick are improving all the time um, so we, we need to we need to actually get in the tv business a wee bit all of us as sales people um, to make sure our events are slick our backgrounds are slick our lighting is good our sales studios look look strong sales will be much more online so we'll have to have that almost TV standard of, of production, especially with new customers that don't know us and are, are getting to see us for the first time on a screen rather than face-to-face. -face. That's challenging. Um, okay, I'll, I'll knock that down. There's, a, there's another question um, from Colin Walls. From COVID-19, working capital has become challenging, um, particularly in international trade where working capital cycles can be extended, although it depends on your payment terms, I guess. Um, have there been experiences around the panel where suppliers or buyers have sought to change the terms because of the COVID situation to maybe take advantage of it? Anybody want to pick that up? Has anybody had that problem? No? Okay, good. Not, not so much on that. The big, big problem for us all probably is the raw material costs are going up and up now. Yeah. So, you know, when you've got a product like ours that's on the shelf for a certain price and... Mm -hmm. You know, we can't expect our customers to be hitting the pocket because so it's just finding a way through. And I think people are going to be a lot more understanding coming out of this that everything's going to be more expensive. Well, mm. it's already more expensive, considerably more expensive. Yeah. Class coming in from Europe and overseas and stuff for us, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think everybody's margins are getting squeezed a wee bit, all right. Um, yeah. 
Uh, one thing I've managed to do is to get, I'm, I import in one of my businesses, I import loudspeakers from the USA and mm. because their sales have been so poor, but I've remained positive and I've probably been their best seller worldwide. I managed to persuade them into sending me stock without having to pay for it. Whereas previously I had to pay for everything up front okay. so because the market is so depressed. It's not a bad time to try and make new deals. If you mm. are managing to keep your business ticking over and doing a bit of business for other people. Yeah. yeah. So, there's so, some positive in it, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially, it depends, I suppose, on how important you are also to them in terms of building business. But the, for, for volume, they'll probably negotiate and trade, for sure. Um, from Ian Mackey, there's a question there. Um, TV standard adverts, uh, since that um, came up, uh, what have the participants done to up the quality of their output and their visuals and their advertising? Uh, he, he says he has a vested interest in the answer. As he, he, <laughs> he has a TV studio and the ability to take <laughs> up our games collectively, I guess. So what, what, have, what are we all doing or have we reacted to that yet? Yeah, we've, we've done personally here at Essence, we've done a Sky TV ad over the last six months. We've done an STV ad we've been, we were lucky to be part of. We are on a Channel 5 TV programme a week on Friday, Secret Scotland with Susan mm -hmm. Kalman. Yeah. Um, and we are running a radio campaign in Glasgow from next Monday. You just have to be visual, you have to be on it, and, and we are doing a huge marketing and visual rebrand for the start of next year, so that as we do hopefully come out of COVID and that, we have got a whole new look, new feel, new identity for people to really fall back in love with it again, you know? Absolutely. Good. We're we're probably not so much on the TV advertising. We we don't do any of that, but more along the lines of uh, the challenge that we have with uh, exhibitions that we were planning to do next year. Mm -hmm. We have uh, we have Plan B that we need to crack onto immediately, which is to really uh, think about doing something next year, which is a super um, kind of virtual exhibition, which takes in which is just one that we own ourselves and takes in likes of webinars, talks, um, customer forums, getting some really good discussion and trying to build up quite a lot of that um, impression of Galeforce being a really good go-to knowledge base uh, for uh, equipment and technology and aquaculture sector. So that's, uh, although it's not kind of around about advertising, maybe kind of touches on the, mm. the uncertainty around the exhibitions that we're certainly we're certainly fine at the moment. We're at that kind of cut-off point now where we really need to commit to something because we have a, a queue of suppliers that are asking us, what are we planning to do, you know, in terms of building, physical build of stands and all that kind of stuff and, you know, committing to travel and hotels. And actually it's not the, as much as we know everything that's been said about vaccines this week, it really still feels a wee bit, uh, a, a little bit away uh, in terms of exhibitions. So yeah. uh, that's what our plans are at the moment. Yeah, and coming back to, you paused on the advertising word, and I think if we treat that flexibly, what you're trying to achieve is a platform that establishes a knowledge leadership um, platform, I guess, in the industry as being experts in your field and not selling, really selling subtly and under the radar through that knowledge leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, can I ask how many people here normally would attend trade shows, just a show of hands? with your product mm. i take it the cost of that kind of gives you the bulk every time you go because the costs do add up don't they it doesn't um, give me it doesn't give me the bulk it gives my md the bulk though aye. <laughs> um, <laughs> see if there was a product which there sort of is that we're working on developing where instead of you sending 20 staff to a trade show you could send five vr headsets and we could render your sales space or your office or your product in a 3D environment, but then add cameras to that. And the people at the trade show can put on a VR headset and they're in your office or your sales room looking at your product through a camera, but in a virtual environment and a rendered environment at your office. How many people would that be of interest to? Yeah, that would be of interest. Well, I think it would, although I think, I think Gail for sure partly down that road. Some of your VR stuff is quite good. Yeah. Um, and, I th and I think everybody's going to be corralled and forced down that channel. Um, quite soon, and, and we should be doing it anyway. But I think we're all going to be forced to. Can, can we're I... working that already, actually. Anyway, yeah, especially okay. with the Chinese market. Yes, yes, yeah. really, really important. Listen, a couple of other questions because I'm conscious of, of time. Um, don't like keeping people late, but there's a um, 
Neil Handy says uh, we're dealing with importers and exporters. Great to hear what the panelists have done around um, managing foreign exchange risk when rece researching new international market, and then in the longer term in managing, I guess, the revenue risk. So managing exchange risk, is it, has it been a, a big factor for anyone? Not, not really. We've, uh, we, we tend to uh, manage our own risk. You know, whenever we sell in euros or US dollars, we, we tend to tailor our purchases around that. You know, so if we, have, uh, if we have plenty of euros coming in, we tend to buy in Europe. If we've, uh, when we, we buy components in China, we buy in dollar or euro. Uh, so we tend to rarely do we have to uh, look to change money uh, because we manage that risk ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So netting your supply chain against your customer base. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, nobody else, obviously, too concerned about the exchange risk factor too too dramatically. No, okay. Um, Bridget's floated a question in there to say, you know, how maybe ask it in two parts. How important is the networking discussion that that like today, for example, but also an organisation specifically like Causeway in in opening up opportunities. Jimmy, I think you said earlier on, it might not be today, but it could be down the road. How, how important is that? Yeah, yeah, it's hugely, hugely important. And as Martin touched on that as well, it's not just about hollow conversations with people. It's you, you know, you, you almost want these people in these other countries to be as important to you as part of your family because they're, they're a big crucial part in feeding your family in the, next, <laughs> the foreseeable future, you know, if it works out. So growing that relationship and treating them with the respect that you expect to be treated with yourself can go a long way just on common courtesy, cultures, you know, things like that. All these things, you know, do your homework and learning the cultures and even silly things like handing over business cards that we take for granted. Yeah. Different cultures are done differently and just, yeah. you know, when people are getting up at a table to leave to go to the bathroom, all these different things and different cultures, yeah. this is hugely important, you know, and yeah. as, as we touched on with the awards in that area as well, yeah. in the UK, it might just be in another award, but in these countries overseas, that's a stamp of a yeah. brand is, is head and shoulders above, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's important, that, you know, John Murray just made a comment online there, which are in the chat. Which is people buy from people, which yeah. I think is really true. And and but a minute ago we we're talking about VR and headsets, and and that's really important also. But do we lose a little by not having the opportunity to meet people just at the moment? Um, is is for example with China, there's a big event there, Jimmy, this week. Um, yeah. are, are, how are you handling that on the ground, considering you can't be there yourself? We are d working through WeChat, through social media, WeChat videos, talking to people, communicating. But it's the same. I mean, let's be totally honest about it. Yeah, it's different. It's not perfect. It's not the way it is. Mm. And anybody here that's successful at what they do, when you meet somebody in person, you mm. know within that first minute if they're right for you. Mm. And you can never replicate that feeling. Yeah. You know, over the, over the internet, VR, whatever, but yeah. Yeah. we just have to learn it's a new, we're in a new a new world, we're in a new future for the foreseeable, so we can't complain about it, we need to find new ways to keep doing business and keep getting stronger, because yeah. the alternative isn't good. No, the alternative is, is, is we, we curled up in the corner, and, and yeah. as you as your stop line often says on your messages, onwards we have to go. Or onwards yeah. we go. <laughs> we, we will eventually get back to back to visiting people, and you know, because I still think, no matter how much you can zoom or MS Teams or whatever, mm -hmm. you still need to have face to face and have that uh, person to person relationship. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, we, we we found through you know face to face. Um, it sounds obvious to say, it, but we've really been able to get under the skin of our customer challenges when we're get somebody round a dinner table or, or take them out or whatever it might be, that's when you get them, get your customers to kind of loosen up and really start to build the trust. And uh, so that, that obviously at this time is a struggle and uh, we would hope that we would be able to get to that uh, when it's obviously safe to do so. I think that's something we're missing at the moment. Um, yeah. No, I think that's true. And, and listen, uh, Jamie talked about the importance of having crack and, and, and enjoying it every day. And, yeah. and, you know, I have to say, coming back to your point, Mark, as well, about the, the, the getting onto the skin of those conversations, some of that hasn't all food and alcohol and rugby 
and various things, you know, and, and it's it's important to to have that connection with a customer, which you kind of never will get on a on a screen. Um, so yes, it's important. Uh, and John Murray then adds a, a comment on the screen, which is and throw in a bit of believe in yourself, and, and there you go. And and Jimmy, you made a great point earlier, which is we're, none of us are necessarily you know rocket scientists. We're not always the most talented people on the planet, but if we're applied, committed, and focused, uh, and uh, and really understand the customer, we can we can make it happen. Um, well, if anybody follows me in LinkedIn, they'll see that my grammar is absolutely awful, but I managed to run three companies with, me, with an amazing team of people making me look better every day. But you've got to also embrace your absolutely. weaknesses, you know. Totally. Listen, there was a comment that I meant to pick up earlier that I, I skipped that Eugene made, uh, Eugene Mullen, and it was about um, the importance of great design. And it made the point that Martin had the bottle before he had the gin. Uh, but also, I think, from your perspective, Jimmy, the importance of great design in building the, the brand is probably absolutely critical. Yeah. Oh, one million percent. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we evoke the sense of smelling people. I mean, this new stuff comes out mm -hmm. in, the, in the turn of the year. You see that we're going to be playing on another one of people's senses as we move forward with that as well. So it's all about just trying to keep finishing that journey that we started by mm -hmm making people more involved and more more into what we're doing. And as Martin said, mm. if you can do something that's a little bit unique and different and, and cap own that market before other people get in there, yeah. you get a great... But again, I keep going back to it. What's in the bottle is just as important as what's what the bottle is, you know, and it's the same mm. for us. What's in the glass or what's in the box is just yeah. as important. So it's, it's got a huge part of that mm. is, you know, yeah... The visual is absolutely imperative, but you have to have, you know, you have to have absolute quality in there as well. Yeah. Now, I mean, design does not have to be about the pretty things. Uh, you know, for example, in Gale Force, um, you know, a, a feed barge mark could be essentially a concrete cube, whereas the feed barge on that visual we showed was quite slick and quite well designed. Uh, is, is that aesthetic part important to the customer? I think it is nowadays, yeah, because the, the, the kind of generation of fish farmers that are coming through now are far younger and far more uh, digitally astute and mm. are more into automation of feeding of fish and mm. uh, are into gadgets, whereas fish farming traditionally is quite a, you know, it's quite a rough and ready kind of thing. So it is, a, I, th I think it does make a difference, you know, mm. the look and uh, the look and feel of the, the product, mm. whether it's fish farming or candles or gin or whatever, it's, it's, it's very, very important. And George, do farmers care about colours and paint runs? Um, <laughs> they do. They do. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it, it's what I meant to say earlier there as well, you know, uh, you do have to know your market. You know, the, the, the thing has to look the part. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, you could have sent a product out and it would have had a scrape and a score and they would have said, ah, sure, it's a land roller. It's going to, that'll be all right. You can't do that now. It must, it must look as good as a car when it goes out. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you must know your market as well. You know, and it's, the guys are talking there about, you know, what's in the bottle needs to be as good as how, as the bottle looks. Mm -hmm. You know, when, like we sell a trailer in, uh, we sell a trailer in Scotland, it'll go with a pickup hitch. But if we sell a trailer in, uh, if we sell a trailer in, in Australia or New Zealand, it has to go with a jack. Mm -hmm. Because they, they think it's too expensive to have put a, a pickup hitch on a tractor, yeah. you know. So they have to have, you know. So you have to know these small subtleties uh, that the market demand, rather than just what you're giving them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, listen, I'm conscious it's now two minutes to the time that we said we'd finish. So have we got any final questions from around the, the, the screen or the group that's there? Because um, we're we're just about on time. <clears throat> And if not, uh, there's one there just uh, dropping in. Um, oh, that's just Suzanne just saying we'd appreciate yeah, that's it. Just, we're asking for some post-event survey. It's just six short questions if people can just that's hit the link at the end. That would be great. That's fine. Once we've stopped talking, that, that's perfectly fine. No, no bother. Perfect. That's grand. But if, if there are no final questions, I don't see any hands raised or any more chat questions coming in. Um, what I'd like to do is thank all of you absolutely hugely for spending the time with us this evening. I've enjoyed the chat. Um, hopefully the panel have enjoyed hearing um, and having the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, you know, coming from a, a very rural area and a small peripheral region, I have a strong commitment to the importance of companies sustaining local communities. Uh, and that's why we're all here today. 
uh, and we're all succeeding and impassioned and driven by success and, and employment and building houses and attracting people to, to the regions that we come from and long may that continue. So thank you very much for your time. And if you can take that survey very briefly, that's great. Uh, and equally, come back to Causeway, join us, um, come back to the networking events, join the, or the organization. We're hoping to have a big bash in, in, in uh, a dinner next summer. Watch this space, come visit the website and keep informed on that. And, um, and free, free to come back, come back and visit us again. So thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Thanks everyone guys. for coming along today. Uh, if you want to come along to our forthcoming Causeway events, you're very welcome. And for those of you who don't know, who aren't currently members of Causeway, we have corporate memberships from 315 quid. Be delighted to chat to you and to tell you more about the network. We'll be in touch anyway in the next couple of days with the link to the recording of today's event. So thanks everyone. Uh, hopefully catch you soon at the next Causeway event. You're very welcome. Have a good evening.